Right, um, here we go. Thank you very much for coming along to this session. It's, um, it's something we started at last MIP, at MIPCOM. Um, its aim is to be um, an objective wrap-up of, uh, of the key trends that went down here over the past six days. And by objective, I mean um, the people we've chosen to come and speak today um, don't have agendas as such. They won't be saying, my company's the best. They will be, um, they'll be giving their views and uh, of, of all the hottest trends of, uh, of the past few days. So, um, introductions. This is uh, Omri Marcus, who's a uh, formats developer for Red Arrow Entertainment. My <laughs> and your microphone doesn't work. <laughs> uh, this is Richard here from um, the Connected TV blog at Market TV. Um, Mark Goodchild is, uh, describes himself as a TV producer and digital misfit. Uh, his career includes stints at the BBC, amongst other places. And um, you must all know Simon Staffens over here because he is um, a star tweeter at MIPS. And, um <laughs> and he's also a format developer with um, Media City Finland. So, um, what I thought we'd do is pick out the pick out the key trends by each. I've asked each of our participants to pick out a key trend and an image that goes with it, and that way we'll be able to delve in what's really stood out for us um, at MIP this year. So, Omri, can we see your picture? What yeah. what is this? That's an ITV uh, studio show called The Audience, and from. I, I picked it for because of three reasons. The first of all, it's such a MIP a material, nobody watched it, but everybody is talking about it. And the second reason, it's because it's very uh, social um, element to that of peer-to-peer. -peer. People are helping other people. Mm -hmm. So uh, neighbors, they are f uh, how many of you know the show? Okay, uh, surprisingly, because yesterday at the Grand, everybody was talking about it. Uh, it's 50 people are just walking behind you and giving you help with your daily uh, uh, problems. According to what I understand, I haven't watched it. But uh, it's one of a couple of shows that are uh, based on the wisdom of the crowd. Uh, I should also mention uh, Sparks, uh, my 5,000 friends. It's a similar concept, isn't it? You're sort of uh, no. being advised by people all the time. No, actually, that's a different one. I was, uh, it's funny, I was, last year I was talking in MIP formats about the fact that I, I've, I don't understand how Facebook, even though there are tens of formats that are based on Facebook, I, I don't see how Facebook will turn into a TV show. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of uh, shows that surprise me with their uh, ways of doing that, but all of them are from comedy angle. My, my 5,000 friends, is about a, a stand-up comedian that is going to visit all his 5,000 friends on Facebook. Right. Which is very nice. And there is the other one called the Anti-Social Network, where three comedians are taking over all your social media activity and kind of ruin your life. It's by Nerd from the UK. Mm -hmm. So this is the peer-to-peer -peer Facebook kind of shows. And the other one is really the Wisdom of the Crowd, which I saw a couple of them. Uh, be the average by genetic from the states, and there are a couple of uh, uh, other uh, wisdom of the crowd uh, uh, shows. So I think the the, the audience. I'm, I'm looking forward to see that, but that's my pick. So would you say that from what you've seen here, the um, formats developers are are taking on the connected side of things. They're taking on social media. They're working it into their formats from the get-go, or are they... You would like me to say yes, wouldn't you? Well, no. <laughs> okay. um, the TV developers are usually very reflective to, to what's going on. So if there is a new technology, TV creative will be the first to embrace it. Afterwards, the broadcaster commissioners are the, gate, the real gatekeepers. We, are, well, we get our uh, muse from pretty much whatever we see around us. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's technology or, or just a buzzword or whatever. So social media was such a great gift to all of us because it opened a whole world of uh, uh, questions, philosophical questions that we tried to came up with uh, uh, relevant shows for them. 
I mean, I came in this market, I have two dating shows. Both of them are based on technology. Um, I won't promote them. Uh, Mark Barnett and Kinetic are doing that uh, in the States. But I mean, both of them are based on social media uh, questions that uh, I'm seeing uh, around. So uh, creative people are not gatekeepers for that. We are embracing pretty much everything. Social media is the best thing happened to us. OK, uh, great. So the, the sort of formats that you've seen going around uh, at this market are really showing that. I, yeah. Or not enough? No, not enough. Mm. That's the, the, okay. the most accurate answer. Not enough because uh, uh, the um, commissioners are afraid from uh, embracing that. It's, it's very risky and it's true. It's very risky. Mm -hmm. A commissioning editor that will pick the wrong show will have a flop in his hands and we have already a, an experience of a couple of years of shows that said this, is, this will bring Facebook to our TV and they all flopped. Mm. I can't think about on a single one that brought Facebook or Twitter to your TV as a kind of a mega a shiny flow game show that succeeded. Mm. Uh, so. so that remains to be achieved. Yeah, but I think that uh, sometime in the next few years, somebody will find out a way to make uh, to make it, mm -hmm. and he will make loads of money out of that. <laughs> That's for sure. We um, just moving on then to another trend. Richard's trend is also a connected trend, and it's been uh, a big talking point at this market. It is, if we could put that that image up, please. It's um, the deal that was it was actually announced just before MIP um, with all three media, the producer, um, giving their content directly to viewers via, via connected TV apps. Why, why is that an important shift, Richard? Uh, I, <clears throat> I think it's an important shift because um, <clears throat> when you, I, I think when you go around to an event such as MIP TV and you ask people like television producers and the creators of programming you know who really deserves to have the relationship with the the end user and i think you'll find that actually the creatives feel like they are the ones and typically in the value chain they have not been the ones identified like in the music industry you're seeing a lot of direct to fan relationships now and this step by all three media which is an indie uh with a lot of uh with a lot of great programs to go direct to consumer via google television is a huge leap i think for the industry it's a, it's a fantastic uh, test or trial ground to see if American consumers will actually buy into it. It's a new chance for uh, production companies to build relationships with brands in a different way. Typically, they have not been included in those conversations. That's normally the turf of the broadcasters. So there's all kinds of you know, new environments erupting, I think, from this move from all three media that could be potential for the future. There's going to be 150 to 200 million connected televisions in people's homes globally in the next few years. You can't buy a TV that's not connected to the internet now, pretty much today. So this whole new concept of delivering content over the top and new gatekeepers in the living room. That's the key thing, isn't it? I mean, uh, Yeah, the new gatekeepers in yeah, the living room. Because we know about connected TV. Uh, it's interesting, but the... The thing here is that a lot of broadcasters must be bothered about this. I mean, all three media make uh, skins, they make all sorts of great shows, and now it's, they're delivering it direct to consumers. That, has anyone had any feedback from broadcasters about it? Well, I think broadcasters are quite scared at the moment, to be honest. Um, there will be a broadcast conference later on this year where 150 CEOs are going to gather together in London to, to talk about these very sorts of things. Over the, content, over the top content and new gatekeepers in the living room are a huge threat and an opportunity at the same time, depending on how they embrace it. Mm. There was another um, huge related trend here. Um, so we had the Angry Birds keynote uh, the other day. Um, everyone was really pleasantly surprised that they were announcing their first animation series. Um, so that, that was made a huge buzz on the, on the blog, on Twitter and everything. Um, but what people were talking about less is that they're not giving that series to a, a broadcaster, they're going to distribute it themselves. So they're bypassing the traditional value chain, yes. which is what all three media is doing, in a sense, mm. and which I think we'll see more and more of in the future. Mm. Mark, you wanted to comment on that? But the thing that uh, Rovio have got, they've already got the biggest channel that you could possibly want. Every one of those apps that's in some, on someone's iPad or, or, or iPhone somewhere 
can be they can put a push push notification to them, so they don't they don't need a broadcaster. And I think that's mm. what's shifting is mm. that this sort of assumption that the only route to market is through the people who powered your televisions is the way to go. I mean, mm. you know, and brands are doing the same. Heineken, we've seen doing the same thing. Mm. There are people who now have relationships with their audience, which doesn't necessarily require them to have had the channel the traditional TV channel sitting on your space. And I think that's just going to grow. We've seen it in the... I would work in the kids' space. We've, had, we've seen it already emerging in the kids' space with the likes of Club Penguin and Moshi Monsters. They're already just going directly to market. And interestingly, they're using old media buying. So, but, you know, they, they both... Moshi Monsters and Bin Weevils have said the big take-up was by buying advert space on the children's channels. Um, but they're using it to drive to their digital media as being the place which they monetize. Mm. But yeah, you're right. The the seven, I think it's 700 million uh, Angry Birds games downloaded so far. That's one hell of a network. Yeah. That um, I mean, what what TV network could could rival that? Um, so yeah, it's uh, interesting times for sure. The there's an, there's another connected trend that we talked about a lot here at MIP TV and especially MIP Cube was the whole uh, social TV thing. It's another, it's another buzzword, it's, it's banded about a lot. But if we could show Mark's picture, please. Um, so why, why did you choose this picture, Mark? Um, so yeah, so you know, everyone, uh, I think it was about two years ago that uh, Twitter did a keynote here at um, MIP TV and they were talking about, you know, pay attention to us, look at what's happened with the MTV Awards. Now, uh, I think this year particularly really aware that all the big uh, production companies have a social media strategy now. And what, what I think is interesting is where it used to, the conversation used to be all about how do you harness Twitter, particularly Twitter, in, in the window of the programme, which is that middle bit, that entertain. Mm. Um, people are now starting to go at, at the side. So it's about extending that broadcast window to being a sort of relationship window which works either side. Um, People are doing it successfully. You know, there are a whole bunch of, you know, Twitter were here and they were giving the, you know, the must-have rules. of If you've got a program, make sure you grab a hashtag, make sure you get your uh, uh, loyalist tweeting about it in advance. Um, you know, there is a danger that what, very quickly we're getting to a, a place which is every program will have its hashtag, every program will have a sort of a certain amount of buzz, but then it, it all becomes normalised again and then how do you break through through the noise, and I, uh, I'm always have a sort of a slightly mixed reaction about when TV tries to appropriate um, something. You know, going back to the Facebook conversation, you know, it's sort of Facebook is is a connected medium. You know, it works because it's about connecting people, and then television jumps on bandwagon very quickly and creates some pretty poor formats around that because they don't really embrace what what these, this is about. I think there's a, a, a danger that you might get a bit of a, a um, Twitterati backlash around certain things. You're already seeing certain programs that go hell for leather to try and get get the uh, Twitterati t tweeting about them, but then they say they just turn around and say it's a really rubbish show. Mm. That's a, that can backfire very quickly. But it's people are waking up to it and building it into their production process or at least their marketing thinking. There was also a lot of a chat this market about um, who should be doing this. Should it should it be the broadcaster or should it be the producer? Again, it's the it's the it's the shifting roles thing. Do you have a do you have a take on that, Simon? I think the ones who have the who can get the funding should do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, what I think is that uh, uh, well. What I was coming to with the funding thing is just that I think that we would need venture capitalists when it comes to content, and we need to get them in quite quickly. Because I've been hearing so many people talk about all their ideas and what they want to do, but then you go into the fact that you need to have someone commissioning it to be able to do it, to, to even raise the funds for the pre-development phase to be able to sell it. So uh, a couple of venture capitalists. Uh, uh, please, yes. Well, there's there's a, a friend uh, Nuno Bernardo from Be Active Media who's saying that he uh, he fund gets his transmedia projects funded by selling them as if they were R and D. Um, so he manages to get R and D, uh, sorry, yeah, research and development budgets to fund his projects because they're just sort of 
out there and that that works for him so there are, there are different ways of getting funding it's all opening up really waiting in line in brussels basically <laughs> well yeah it, 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 it worked for him i don't know if it'll work every time but yeah the the fun, the funding is out there, you've just got to look for it in, in unexpected places. I, I think multi-platform commissioners at Channel 4 and other UK broadcasters in particular are looking for, if you don't come in the door with a second screen strategy or a social strategy, you're going to go on that pile. <laughs> you know, yeah. I think it's important that, that content producers think about these things and come, you know, come along with their ideas, definitely with a, with a second screen strategy. They're going to be looking for that. Mm. There is, there is a challenge, though, because a lot of the broadcasters are still in that space where, A, that they've got the legal responsibility of being the publisher, you know, and there's also the sense of you know, brand control that when you start pulling together the wild west of, of uh, the, the tweet community, the, the Twitter community, and then slap it bang side your authored content... You know, you can't control that bit on the right, which is the tweet deck. Mm, and that's it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And increasingly, people are trying to, con you know, they're trying to work out how you do it, and you put different filters on it. But but in immediately, the audience see through that because it's funny. You know, I'm just seeing whether this has been moderated. Um, are there any, you know, where have all the negative comments gone? Um, and you know, what, it, it, when you start having thousands of people tweeting about something, there are. Had not necessarily as many, but there are a lot of negative uh, haters going to hate. And, and the minute you start then becoming a sort of a top-down, we're uh, pa uh, uh, patriarchal, we know what's best for you, um, people are going to go, well, we'll stop using that hashtag, we'll use another hashtag. And I think that, you know, the audience is sophisticated. Mm. And I, 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 I do think broadcasters are still in the play, a place where they're struggling to understand you know, what is their role in this? My personal feeling is that, that it should be a facilitator. Give, you know, be the person who gives the hashtag so that everyone knows what you're talking about, but don't try and control the community because mm. they will, they will uh, have a backlash on you. Simon. Yeah, absolutely, I agree fully that social, social media and social formats and television, combining those are about trying to control that which you cannot control, uh, basically. So the more you, you're prepared to let go, I believe that once again, content is king as long as you can provide, provide people with a good story or good enough content for them to get involved in, the majority of the social media buzz will be positive. So you just have to uh, let people have that opportunity mm. and not try to shackle it. And it, it depends what you do with it as well. I mean, the, Tony Wang from Twitter gave that great example of the, the political TV show in the States, which was where all the social, the Twitter data was presented like post-match data of a, of a sports event. And they were using it to say, this is the hashtag if you think he answered the question. This is the hashtag if you think he dodged it. Um, so they were just really playing with that in quite a, in quite a fun way. Yeah. But, the, you know, the, the, the pro professional pollsters will balk at that because it's a self-selecting audience who tend to shout very loud. You know, people who t tweet shout a lot. Uh, about what they what concerns them, you you get a, you there've been um, research pieces to sort of compare that with more uh, controlled, uh, demographically relevant uh, audiences, and you Twitter is definitely much more polarized. Um, so when you then start using it to ref say that's a reflection of the whole of the the American population, you know you're on dodgy ground. If you're saying it's a reflection of what people on Twitter are saying. Great, you know, yes. we know that they're a particular demog demographic, it's a growing demographic, but it's not everyone, and don't kid yourself that it is everyone. Mm. You've got to be careful about how you present it, that's for sure. So, lots of, lots of progress, lots of uh, connectedness, but also with all this progress comes a lot of, a lot of jargon, a lot of uh, buzzwords, and that's your, that's your example, isn't it, Simon? Can we... So <laughs> you've got a nice little meme picture uh, for us. I like there. those meme generators on, <laughs> that you find on the interwebs. So this is condescending Willy Wonka saying, so clips of the show are on YouTube. Tell me more about your amazing transmedia strategy. Um, I, I, I met quite a few people this year who last year were uh, cross-media producers. And they still have the same projects, but they are now transmedia producers. 
which is, you know, it's just, I, I can understand it perfectly because it's a good buzzword to throw into a conversation or into a pitch that we're doing this transmedia, this and transmedia, that. At the same time, it's, it's diluting the term to quite an extent. I mean, we have people who have been doing transmedia ish stuff for years who know who refuse to use the term anymore and there's really no other term to go to and I won't bore you with my definitions of transmedia I was listening to some pitch here and, and or some discussion every single one started off my definition of definition of transmedia is mm. and then so I won't bore you with that no but it is important we talked about this at, at the last wrap it is important to to remind people of what it's supposed to be okay and which is what, again, what Nuno was saying to us yesterday was that it's story first, platform second. It's not, um, we must do something for mobile, we must do something for the internet. Does everyone agree on that? Yeah. Okay. I think the, 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 the big thing about transmedia for me is, I'm, and I come from a traditional background where I've started in radio and tele and then have done a lot of uh, cross-platform, I'm not going to use the word, uh, cross-platform projects. But I think there is a fundamental difference and one is where the product starts around a story and then you work out how it gets, you know, using sort of TV, you know, CGI language, you know, gets rendered into different platforms, rendered onto television, rendered into, onto a website or whatever. As opposed to what a lot of television does is it starts off defining the end product first. It's a 60-minute documentary. Let's work backwards and get the assets to fill that space. And I think, for me, transmedia is interesting because it starts with the sort of core of a story and then works out how might it f be facilitated on different platforms. And mm. I think that's what the transmedia the early transmedia community, or the people who are sort of now feeling that they've sort of slightly been uh, being swamped by everyone using the term, come from a discipline about how do you tell a really great story and work out what platforms are best, mm. rather than just going, we need to do our traditional story, which was actually designed for a 30-minute slot on, on, on TV, and then how do we cut, chop it up and put it on other platforms? Yeah, it has to be thought transmedia yeah. from the outset. Yeah. So, Simon, you um, pitched the transmedia format at the MIP formats pitch. No, multi-platform, not transmedia. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about Honestly. that. Uh, the, the show. Yes. That I pitched, oh, it was one called Which One Out. It was uh, our attempt to make a an extremely tight game show that at this would encourage gambling, risk-taking, uh, well, rewarding knowledge and stuff like that, and uh, have a game mechanic that would uh, uh, reward p people who participated and played along at home as much as possible to give as much positive feedback as possible. I can tell you the, the format's now off the market, so I can't, I'm not pitching it to anyone. <laughs> uh, but what I was going to say was just regarding transmedia, because there's, there's been... The, uh, there is a great need for transmedia storytelling methods to be applied to uh, content. When a, uh, a big track here was the branded entertainment, right? And and uh, the woman from Nestle, I can't remember her name, Burger or something, but she was uh, she had this the blue bear bow, the blue bear, right? And they were going to roll out that in a lot of different ways. But I doubt they have actually, you know, built a solid foundation, the story world, the mythology. Who is Bo? What is his motivations? Where does he come from? Where is he going? Etc. and so on. Just to be able to make new entry points into that story world. And how come we're talking about a, a 3D bear at a, at a TV conference? It also <laughs> no, it just shows that how much things are changing. Um, but to, to, just to get back to the, try and stay on the formats um, and transmedia bit, um, the, uh, the format that won the MIP formats pitch was a, was a dating format. You were, you were talking about that just now. It's a, it's a great, something that has great potential with all this participatory stuff we're talking about. Yeah, I have. And exactly uh, like, like we said before, it's, they didn't use the technology itself, they took the essence of the technology, the philosophical questions, what is better the uh, personal uh, people that your best friend know better for you who will be a good match for you or a computer. Mm. It's like all the competition between a, a person versus computer playing chess, uh, it's pretty much like that. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I'm trying to think if they had a transmedia uh, uh, element in that show. It was multi-platform. For um, me, you know, I told you that for me, transmedia is media that dressed like a woman in the hands. <laughs> I don't really get that, uh, all those descriptions. There was, a, there was also, that reminds me, there was a huge buzz about the, the uh, Paul Abbott was here talking about his new show uh, in which Chloe Sevigny plays a transsexual assassin. I, I'm, I'm sure you're going to be all over that one. Download it now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think the worst word I've heard... <clears throat> actually this year at MIP is transmedia brandcasting, yeah. which is actually a real mouthful. But yeah, it is getting, you know, it is getting split up and there's a lot of controversy over the name. But the fact of the matter is there's an Emmy Award. There is an Emmy category now for transmedia production. There is, there's it's a content been 360 kind category. of bolted into the system now. So we have to live with it. Mm. Yeah, but all those new terms every time, I feel like next year I will go and in the mini bar, the, you can open it and get, get a buzzword that you can use <laughs> in conversation. Well, we have, to, we have to create new language. We're in the new world, too. Yeah. But there, there, there's a, there was a rationale for why transmedia emerged, and it was because it was getting an official credit in the States. Uh, and that's really important in terms of the, the you know, the writers' uh, unions. Um, so that, you know, it took a long, it took people a while to get it recognized that this was an official skill, story architecting, storyboard. And, and so, you know, I think give them their due. They can hold on to their word and, you know, work with that word. And I think that it, it, it's... What we, what I think, I, I personally feel is it doesn't really matter what you call it, but uh, but don't try and treat everything as the same. Don't think that you're creating a, you know, a multifaceted, uh, infinite parallel universe story uh, mm. architecture. Yeah. If what you're doing is taking some clips and chopping them up and putting them on YouTube, because you'll just confuse people if you tell them it's um, mm. if uh, it's a transmedia universe. Yeah. So you should only go on the platforms that are relevant yeah. to the story. Is is the basic guideline i think um we haven't one thing we haven't talked about yet is um mip doc the the thing that um they're also a bit like the 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 3d bear something that uh, the mip doc keynote adam g from channel 4 was talking about was it just blew me away it was um, a health program where people were diagnosed on live tv with their webcams how how, how is that TV. I mean, it probably says more something about the state of the NHS in Britain than. <laughs> no, but, uh, I spoke to Adam afterwards, and he was saying, you know, they, that was made by Maverick, a very uh, production company who've done a lot of interactive stuff with Channel Four over the years, and they've sort of just been emerging what was um, uh, a, a strand around uh, embarrassing bodies, etc. Yes, that's what it's um, called. Yeah. Uh, but what, what was really fascinating is that they are inundated with people applying to be on the next series. So people are submitting to, and I, can't, I couldn't work it out whether it's because everyone wants their 15 minutes of fame and it's got so, uh, so bad now that they're prepared to strip off and uh, embarrass themselves completely. Or, you know, what they genuinely do is they have a very good support network about helping people through... Um, you know, looking at you know STDs, you know what, whatever. STDs and webcams and exactly. And no, it is it is quite mm. an explicit show. Mm. Um, it's not something you want to watch with your mother beside you. Mm. Um, but uh, it it does very well. But what's interesting is it's almost like you know for me, I think that that some, says something more about how TV has become so normalised about this sort of. Uh, you know, anyone can appear on TV now. Is it's it's not embarrassing um, to that particular audience, an audience who are probably sharing most of this already on Facebook and etc. So that what they've done is they've sort of tapped on something, and it's actually providing you know a public service mm. in terms of the information they do. And apparently they have a very strong triage for all those people who don't get on the show. So it's not a question that you only get support if you uh, expose yourself. So it's tapping into people's uh, exhibitionism, really. The Simon? Yeah, I was just going to say that um, at, at the TV, after the TV hackathon, Sid Lawrence said that TV people should look to radio when it comes to how to handle uh, information about programs, etc. And, uh, I mean, this uh, calling into radio to a team of doctors sitting there, that's, that's probably one of the first radio shows ever made in history. Mm. And it's hugely popular popular in any country. All people phoning in, having a nice ch five minute chat with a doctor who hums and goes, ah, oh, and very slow and slow tempo, and then it's like, oh, take a painkiller and go home, uh, or whatever. 
Uh, so, so just look to ra popular radio shows, uh, make them for television, integrate Skype, and you're set. I mean, next, next thing is going to be uh, we have a show on, on national radio in Finland that's been going on for like 40 years, which is called uh, uh, essentially Nature Guardians. So people phone in and said, I've seen this sort of bird. It looks a bit yellow. <laughs> is it a what? Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that show on television any minute now. Actually, I'm going to make it. Omri? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's, it's interesting because it's the basic question of every show that try to use social media. Social media is very personal element, and your social network I couldn't care less about, and as well as you don't care about my social network. I mean, it's a very personal thing to do, mm -hmm. and I won't I don't think that I would watch a show that people are having a, a medical exam on live TV because I couldn't care less about their STDs problem, and if the, my mother is around or not around, and um, I'm I'm kind of I'm, I'm it's kind of you try to gap this uh, this bridge you need to gap this uh, bridge this gap bridge this gap yeah. Between the uh, so and the, this bridge is the personal story. You need to understand what this story is about, what this man is about. You need to have a kind of relationship to him. You might even hate him and want him that the STD will have very funky results at the end. Uh, but you need to have some kind of emotion toward him. Mm. So this is why uh, Facebook, as Facebook, can't make the transformation toward TV because it's very personal, but you need to take the essence of Facebook, of taking this uh, cloud wisdom, or, or to take this, uh, um, uh, um, I don't know how to, to say it, but how to you how would you find yourself in the same situation? Mm. Um, so it's a problem. And this is what I'm banging my head to the wall every day, trying to figure out a way how to do. So all those technologies are very interesting in terms of sort of understanding viewers better and, yeah. and getting them involved. I, I think the TV has always been social. It's the water cooler effect. It's, you know, it's always, Marshall McLuhan defined it so well uh, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, you know, the hearth in the corner, the, the electronic hearth. Um, social has just gone digital now and it's become real time. You know, that's a fundamental shift and how we embrace that in terms of being content producers or broadcasters or uh, innovators or developers or whatever side of the, 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 the convergence we're coming from is, is, is the big challenge. Mm. So that's the big question of this market. We sensed at Mitblog that this was the maybe the tipping point market where you saw that we've, we've had markets before where lots of people are talking about this is a great idea and we should, we should do this, we should do this, the sort of blue sky. This, this time what I've been really aware of is people actually doing it um, would you would doing the new stuff and and it w it actually working have you have you I, got that impression I, I think we're at an ex still at an experimental stage you know we we know it can work around entertainment shiny floor shows but they have quite simple mechanics where you know lots of people contribute but actually there's you know you're part of the crowd you don't have a re get very much of a personal it's not all about you, it's about us as a group, you know, voting for someone. And we're quite happy with that. I think when you start going into, you know, things like comedy, you know, that's very personal. You know, what one person likes versus another is a sort of a very personal uh, feel. And it, group dynamics work actually much better in the physical space. You know, we, when you're in the space watching a stand-up comedian, you actually laugh because the people beside you are laughing and you, you're part of the atmosphere. And we haven't worked out how to translate that to television at all yet. Um, similarly, you know, factual shows, for me, I think actually one of the big things is about the personalization of the show. You know, when you watch a documentary, it might be a sort of window on the big world, but actually I want a bit of a reflection on what it means to me and my peer group, my social graph. We haven't really worked out how to manage that yet because television is very good at broadcasting. It's not very good at managing one-to-one -one relationships. Mm. And I think, so I think, you know, this year is interesting that we're starting to see formats uh, you know, we got past the talking about it phase. Yeah. We got past the evangelism by the, the tech community, the geeks, which I'm part of. This year, we're starting to see formats come out. I don't think necessarily they're mature enough. They're mature enough yet, and we're seeing the, the killer formats coming through. Mm. I don't know. 
Simon? I absolutely agree. I, I think that, that uh, what I saw from MIPCube onwards, and MIPFORMAS as well, is that all the parts of that make up a good television or a good, good multi-platform concept are reaching a certain level, level of maturity. You have storytellers and, and storytelling people who create the content who are starting to understand technical limitations and possibilities and the need to actually get some money via, via brands. So the, the storytellers look to, to, to uh, you know, work with these other people, not just tell stories by themselves. Whereas the brands uh, are starting to realize the need to actually put out some compelling content mm. and thereby use the storytellers. And the tech people are talking to everyone and no one understands them. But I, mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that, you know, uh, Red Bull does have a thousand pieces of episodes of content here at mm. MIP, which is quite interesting and mm. does, you know, rattle the whole... Uh, <clears throat> value chain somewhat, but if I could talk a little tech talk for a minute, I would love to tell you about something. I actually have no interest in it, and I, I, I'm not involved with the company at all, but I love what they're doing, and I love the fact that an eight-week-old company, uh, after coming out of beta, can get valued at $150 million um, with input of $15 million for a 10% share by Sky. Um, the company's name is Zbox, and the product is called Zbox, and what I love about it, overall, Above and everything, I mean, the check-in is not the answer, and we've heard all this stuff in second screen social TV. What I really love about Zbox is they've done something different, and that's what's making them, you know, have it, have such an impact on the second screen social TV space. <laughs> it's great that I can log in with Facebook. It's great that I can see what my friends are watching. It's great that I can chat with them on the EPG and all that sort of stuff. But what really gets me. What I really love about it is the fact that they ingest all of the UK content now currently in a server farm, they pull using artificial intelligence uh, that, would, that would be uh, audio recognition, video recognition technology, and various other things. They pull metadata in real time from the shows, and they present those, that metadata in the form of tags that come down. While you're watching the show in real time, you're able to see what they're talking about a little bit. Now, that creates a whole other market for you know, in advertising with sponsored tags and a whole new realm. And what it does is, I've always thought, if yeah, content is king, but context is the crown. <laughs> that's what that's what Zbox is giving me. It's giving me context to what I'm watching, and I think that's hugely powerful. And it's something that uh, it's a model that that I think in the future, people who write scripts and are writing content will have to think about in the future, creating the, this, you know, in the web world we live with metadata, it's part of what we do. We create metadata, we tag everything, uh, you know, we tag articles all the time, so it's part of the process. That's the, the guy from um, Grace Note said in the panel yesterday that content is king, um, metadata is empire. This is the, the <laughs> so he's, he's gone one crown. step forward. <laughs> yeah, there's the crown, there's the empire. <laughs> Global whatever. domination is going to become the next one, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but there's, yeah, um, there's also that great example with, uh, that two-screen example with Game of Thrones, uh, with Mizo, who did the, the fan-sourced uh, two-screen experience where you could be watching Game of Thrones and then all of a sudden something pops up saying, did you know this character has this backstory played in this series before? Right. And that's completely f fueled by the fans. I mean, that's, that's pretty, pretty exciting stuff. Yeah. Context is, is important. I mean, how many of us have actually gone to our computers and looked up IMDB or Wikipedia just to find something on the story that we're watching being told on television to get some backstory or, you mm. know, it is... It is very much, and it's a, a very important part of the second screen experience, aside I, uh, from social. Mm. Your point, though, that this is not being done by the creators is interesting because it's sort of, you know, they're, we're starting to see everyone's making a play for the second screen space, and it actually doesn't, you know, the chances are in a couple of years' time, if you haven't actually created your second screen experience, someone will have created it ar around your program. Exactly. You know, can't be legislated for, I don't think. Mm. It's happening. There's a lot of open data out there that people can assimilate. They can tap the, the core audiences who would probably like something which is a little less controlled than coming from an official broadcaster. So you can, you'll, I think you'll see a lot more of these sort of disruptive services emerging. But, I mean, this is the big thing that came out of the 
the hack day had gone on to, to Wired, onto the BBC, it was uh, again Sid Lawrence saying that uh, TV data is, is SHIT. Yeah. Um, that's, True. that's because he is coming from, uh, he's used to being, being able to hack into music APIs like, like Spotify. Um, what do all of you think about um, that, that question? Is, is he right? I, I think the data is there. It's proprietary and it's owned by Rovi <laughs> and it's expensive. So that's the big problem is that, you know, the TV world is a proprietary world. It's very much about IP and, and protection of IP, which mm -hmm. is understandable to a point, but... Uh, w by with you know, Rovi does have an open API and SDK. They have software development kits. I'm surprised that it wasn't used during the hackathon, but it can be used, and they have a lot of stuff. So it's just a matter of I think right now I've identified probably at App Market TV, which I've published, there's probably I've covered probably at least 20 big companies that offer APIs and SDKs. That ranges from Samsung, Sony, the CE manufacturers, right down the line, to, to at least 20 or 30 smaller companies, like Zbox has an API and an SDK, making their stuff available. Everybody wants a third-party development community. <laughs> they all want it. I mean, it's great. Look what it's done for Apple. Look what it's done for Facebook. You know, Apple gave out $2 billion last year to their third-party development community. Huge amounts of money, driving innovation forward. This model is being looked at by television, certainly by some incumbents and some new players. Mm. But the, the question remains, is the TV industry connected enough yet? <laughs> there was the, the wit was saying the other day that there was only 29% only of, new t of new TV shows have a Facebook page and only 15% have a Twitter account. Is that... Is that, is that worrying? I, I continue the conversation about the UK TV industry. I mean, Channel 4 declared that they are going to be the most social network. And so Channel 4 are also the creator of the Wank Week, which is going to make it quite of a, maybe going to be, I'm not sure if they will know how to make their content into the social world in a, in a way that will be elegant, mm. or if they will know how to make it right. Mm. Maybe the, third, the second screen or the um, third parties will be the answer for that. Because I don't believe that the broadcaster really know how to handle this. If they know how to make TV, I mean, they know how to make good TV, they don't know how to handle a, a, the second screen experience, to my opinion, so far. They've been to Channel 4 and BBC, and quite a few networks have been doing some interesting things in that space. Yeah, but always with third parties, not, yes. in, not internal. Often. Uh, I, th I think the point. metadata question is, I mean, you know, I, I disagree with Richard. I, don't, I think actually, you know, people like Rovi are out there and they create them effectively are metadata farms creating surface metadata around programs. They'll tell you what's in a program, they'll tell you how long it is, they'll tell you all the stuff that's easy to find out. The real metadata is the stuff that's inside the producer's head, it's the research notes, it's the stuff mm. about when you were on location. And all of that, you know, my experience working around different independent companies is you know, they normally don't have a researcher or even a producer on the show by the time it's going out. Mm -hmm. So you know, because the, the budgets have been pushed over years, that actually you work on minimal teams, they're mostly freelance, that you then end up in a world where the, the corporate knowledge or the program knowledge you know, the bit underneath the, the iceberg, beneath the, the bit that you can see, is effectively um, binned. And the only way that they can currently work around that is if you get a, a, a cross-platform commission from a broadcaster to then keep a researcher on and keep doing that. And we don't have a standard way of how you, you know, write a script which automatically sucks out all of the metadata from it. You know, mm. that would be a huge advance if, you know, Word could talk to Avid and Final Cut Pro and come up with yeah, a bin of metadata, which I don't have to worry about and I can just, you know, outsource. What, what is Jennifer Aniston wearing and how much does it cost? Who's yeah. doing that? The only person will know that will be the the, the costume buyer. You know, mm. it'll be all be forgotten further down the line, and I think that that, you know, some people are starting to do that. I think the companies who've emerged from the web are probably more savvy about that, and the brands are more savvy about that because that's what fueled their industry in the past. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, so I think you know, I think the hackers are right. You know, I, a lot of I met I met one of them on the plane coming out here. And he was getting very excited about doing this app, and we started having this conversation. And he was appalled. He was going, what, you don't know? You know, surely you know 
uh, what music tracks are being used in the show. And I said, but probably the person who does will be the person who fills in the music reporting form. Mm. That's, mm. And where that goes, you know, nobody knows. That goes into legal land. And, um, you know, so it's, it's, it's really important what's the, what's the potential for developing, taking yeah. things forward if, if, the, if the developers, the hackers, have nothing to yeah. play with. And I think, I think what's it, what will come out, some, some bigger organisations will crack that and they'll keep it proprietary and they'll do their own stuff with it. And then you've got other people who are probably going to be a little bit, you know, a bit more subversive, open it up. There was a chap, and I can't remember his name, maybe were you the one who was talking about, um, it's a, uh, he's doing a documentary, is it Mick Cube? He's doing a documentary about Pirate Bay. Yes, and he's putting it. He's putting it. He's pirating his own his own show. So he's putting it up on Pirate Bay, and he they're allowing people to tag various parts of the program. And you're sort of going, I love the idea. You've sort of just completely democratised it. Um, I'm not quite sure where he's going with it, mm. but it's, it's of the community. And I suspect there'll be some interesting stuff which will come out of that. And that's, this is the world that we're living in between the you know, control, control, control and, 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 and monetize. And this is Webby. This is let's, uh, let's see what, you know, what, what can clever people do with this stuff if I just opened it up to them. Yeah. And uh, there was also on that panel that great example of the mashup artist who was, who yeah. was here who, uh, who did a mashup of Mad Men where, where. Don loves George. Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, turned into a gay love. And, love that's the, uh, and that did better than the official trailers, <laughs> yeah. but it got taken down. Yeah. And so it got, uh, initially got taken down because the, the spiders saw it as being a copyright infringement and it was automatically taken down and then once you get into that you have to have a lot of will to go and then fight you know get it escalated up the up the chain we we've noticed here anyway with the videos of the sessions we've been posting on on youtube that the in in the past few months i mean the difference with last mip is incredible uh, youtube has got a lot more sensitive at picking out copyrighted content so if we we just have a like 30 second video in someone's keynote bam um we have to get rid of it now so they're they're sort of taking this really seriously is this where we have to do the disclaimer about the slides <laughs> that i just ripped off youtube <laughs> no but it's a, it's a big deal so they are yep. youtube is showing we are uh, on the on the content owner's side we are yep. we are respecting the copyright because that's the only way they can move forwards really um Last thing about, I thought the last point perhaps would be to talk about YouTube a bit. Um, another big buzz thing that came out this week was they were saying um, they want to be less about views and more about channels. They want to, so it's another buzzword, it's engagement. It's not just getting, uh, let's get 10 million views on that video and then forget about it. It's let's suck people in, get them to subscribe. That's a really important change, isn't it? I, I, I think YouTube's interesting because I, I saw Eric Schwartz in Edinburgh last year come up and stand up in front of the UK. Eric, sorry, sorry, the CEO? Schmidt. Schmidt, sorry. Yeah. Got his name wrong. I saw Eric uh, speaking at in Edinburgh and um, he basically stood up there and said that we're not into the content game and don't worry about it. It's all fine. We're not going there. And I think three weeks later they announced or, or it was soon at the same time they were spending $150 million dollars on content, mm. um, which isn't a huge amount, really, but it, it is significant. They are making an investment. YouTube is s making significant investments in content, and it's quite interesting. Uh, they, Google owns the, the, the live rights for cricket in India. Most people don't know that. Mm. Um, you know, they're subtly making their play, and, and, and companies like Google and App, Apple and Microsoft could probably outbid any content or broadcaster company uh, for whatever they want. Mm. What do you think, Simon? Yeah, I think that um, w w when you when we talk about um, um, transmedia in this context, one one of the key points which I think YouTube also has an issue with is the sustainability and and to keep whatever you have going in the long run in a coherent and logical way, mm. which is when you look at you know transmedia projects are quite often fairly arty and, and fairly low budget, many, unless they are, of course, marketing campaigns for Game of Thrones or anything huge like that. And then you have it, and it starts and it ends and then it's gone and then it's just stopped. And, it's, and you can have amassed a community and you can have people who actually care about it. 
And it's also the same thing with, with YouTube, with such a huge amount of content. How do they choose what to push and what not to push? And how does it feed off each other and so forth? It's a, it's a challenge. Okay. Uh, but my suspicion with the YouTube is all about Google TV coming down the line. Because, you know, when, when they have, another, have their second go at getting Google TV placed, they don't just want to be the aggregator of other people's channels. They, you know, there'll be some channels which are front of mind, and they could be YouTube as a mass aggregation channel, or they can be niche channels that could actually uh, target particular demographics. And so, you know, I, I think the fact that they're, you know, in, a, in that sit forward mode, you tend to, you know, most most people watch YouTube still by being referred to it by someone else. You know, so it's, it has a social dynamic. When you're in the lean back mode and you're turning on your telly, you know, if they can start picking off niche markets and go, I'm going to sit in for a night with my feet up watching a YouTube curated channel That's because a I'm a shit. mad fanatic of, um, you know, train, uh, st steam engine, kittens, mm. um, steam engines, fishing. Actually, where the economics didn't work before to have that as a, as a, as a channel uh, through a broadcaster because you'd have to buy, you know, all, all the spectrum and the, the, the carriage costs, etc. That can now hit a niche, and, and the niches aren't necessarily small when you when you uh, multiply that across the world. So all of those kitten lovers um, who want to sit in with the night, kick off their shoes and watch kittens all night, can all get together and watch, sit around a program. Mm. Then the advertising will come in. It'll be Google Google placed advertising rather than you know the other media buyers. Fascinating stuff. Um, the I was, thought we could throw it out to the room if anyone has any questions for our speakers. What are your takes on the on the biggest trends at this MIP? Anyone? We can pass the microphone around if you like. No. Well. Oh yes. Yes, I do have one question about branded entertainment. Mm. Um, you didn't speak about that. I think there is, uh, there has been a tipping point there too because uh, um, I found <coughs> well the the, the Coca Cola keynote very interesting. Mm. Um, it was very um, um, encouraging, inspiring. Uh, what, what do you think about that? That's a good. That's a good question for the panel. It was a Coca Cola saying. It launching their sort of strategy of what they call liquid content. So it's this whole notion of a brand as a content producer and they're being really serious about it now. What do you, what do you think of that, Omri? It's a fascinating thing and I think we are just see the beginning of a, a long process that will, at the end of it, we'll have, we're going to have a completely new category of content. Uh, it will, uh, but I have no idea what's going on, to, why it's, what it, will it create, but I'm, I'm fascinated by that. It's, I have more questions than answer to that. Mm. Um, I, personally, I think the 30-second spot is dead <laughs> or going to. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. It's just my theory. I, I'm not saying it's right or not, but it's going to be a tough call in the future to get people to sit down for 30 seconds and watch, you know, uh, <clears throat> watch commercial television. So I think the brands are having to look for second screen experiences and producing their own content as a matter of, of finding you know, a new ways of engaging with their fans and their consumers. The brands have been sort of ahead of the game in terms of trying to harness the social networks and getting on there. You know, you, every brand has a Facebook page and probably have a, a like gating system. So you have to like them to then go and enter a competition, even mm. if you don't like them at all. Um, so, you know, they're really, the, the brands are so clued up into that world. And the, the smart brands are already thinking about, you know, this is, this isn't, actually a, a retail business anymore it's a service business it's about our relationship you know they all talk about you their their crms and their ecrm so i don't think this sort of extension into uh, entertainment uh, that you sit and consume is a is, is a you know a bizarre step i think it's just a natural step it's sort of in the same way that soaps emerged out of the the adverts that the soap manufacturers originally did and yes in, in soaps are so branded entertainment yeah. yeah and and you know in the uk there are people like fosters who are you know, being very targeted about being associated with comedy fosters want to be the curated br the brand who curate comedy and get mm. associated with comedy and they're they're doing that online they're doing it in you know live entertainment experiential mm -hmm. stuff and they're doing it in television so you know 
the big people are going to step in there early and try and be uh, get that brand a connotation with some, with a particular genre. And I've, so I don't think that that's particularly strange. I think the the dynamic is about how. Uh, that that sits with stuff that we've traditionally seen as being totally independent and authored and uh, and you know when you've got the big corporate entities behind you, what does the audience feel about that? Mm, and, the and, and, and the smart one, the smart money will be embrace their audience and sort of go with them rather than treat them as um, you know idiots who you can manipulate. Mm. And that's the sort of the needle. Simon, are you thinking of a branded transmedia? format for I have several okay <laughs> no but really honestly uh, the coca-cola a uh, good example I, I didn't go to the session but I agree with Omri that it's totally fascinating I, I of course availed myself of the coca-cola 2020 strategy videos on YouTube uh, and what I'm hoping for is uh, basically more brands to go this way so I as personal as a format developer will have an easier time to integrate brands into what I create and make them basically see possibilities rather than threats or, or, or challenges yeah and just to wrap that bit up uh, there was some really interesting tech came out of MipCube where we, we, was, we were talking about that that you can see a piece of video that can actually now do things like retargeting so that typically when you go onto a website if you click on a you know an ad for a shoe um, most people don't buy the shoe the first time um, and so uh, all you know, now when you go onto websites you tend to isn't it a coincidence that there's suddenly being an advert the next time you go to that site there's an advert for the very shoe that you were looking at and you sort yes, of go yes. you know, that's that's all been constructed by clever people like Simon, um, you know, that are using the, the, the tech algorithms to follow that. What they're now doing is that the next time you watch a video, lo and behold, the poster or the, you know, a video of this, the poster in the background, all the, and there was one I saw which was, um, I think that they had just been pitching to the Play, uh, Playboy TV, even the t tattoo on the, uh, on the model's shoulder was uh, um, rendered on the fly Mm. in the video mm. based on who it was who was watching. Incredible. So like in-game advertising. Like in-game advertising, but it's, mm. it's, it's not being done in flash and you have to wait for a loading screen. It's, you, watch, you could be flicking on your television in, in a couple of years' time and what they're watching on TV, you know, in the background of EastEnders, is, a, is an advert. But it happens to be an advert which is targeted at you because mm. we know exactly who you are. So the brands are gonna, the brands are on it. They're gonna be, uh, they're gonna be the first movers in this space. Big brother brands. Big brother brands. <laughs> <laughs> oh, another question. Uh, what What are you seeing about the three D? Is the hype already over? Or? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's funny because two years ago I was at IFA, <clears throat> and. Um, it was all about, uh, IFA is a, is, is a C manufacturer, it's a bit like CES in, in Vegas, but the European version in Berlin. And it was all about 3D TV and, 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 and connected TVs were like the bastard stepchild in the corner, uh, kind of shoveled, you know, and it was just this whole session of, for me it's cyclical, it comes back every 20 or 30 years. Um, that's my take on it, I wrote an editorial about it. I think it's great for the cinema, works excellent for the cinema, but I don't see it working in the living room. Our um, 3D keynote yesterday made a it made a very good point about it. He, st he started off saying 3D isn't a hot ticket anymore, um, but there's still massive potential to do really creative things with it. And this is the guy who produced Pina. Um, I haven't seen the whole film, but even if you just watch the trailer in 2D, the, P the Pina Bausch the, uh, dance film that Vin Vendors did, just watch the trailer and, and you will be blown away and you will really want to watch it in 3D. So uh, maybe we've moved past the sort of technical hype stage and now people can start being really creative with 3D. There's a challenge and it sort of extends to connected TV as well though. Well, whilst you've got platform, you know, it's not convergence, it's divergence where everyone's trying to get their stake in the ground with the different technologies. It makes it very hard for producers to know what horse to back. And it's not cheap to back every horse. So, you know, and this is the same with connected TV. If you want to get into the game, you know, do you go with one platform like Samsung, which is the biggest, has the biggest penetration? 
or you're a big broadcaster, you know, like the BBC, who can afford to go and do LG and all of them. But actually, most people can't afford that that extra cost at the, in the early days to go down that. So you've got to have something that you are you are sure is going to hit an audience. So you, they've got to have the reach of the devices, and you've got to be sure that the the, the added value that you're getting is going to really appeal to the audience. So I, I I'm. I don't think until it sort of stabilizes, you're going to get everyone going. You're not going to get it for just standard formats because actually the 3D doesn't revolutionize uh, you know, most standard formats. Okay, great. We'll have to wrap it up then. Thanks very much for coming. And stay. do get on to MIPblog when you're, when you're back from Cannes or, uh, or if you're watching this online you can pick up all, there's all the live coverage that we've been doing the past few days there's all the conference videos there are a lot of um, white papers that we've got um, like with screen digest for example a connected tv white paper that's a, an exclusive we've got for you and there's also the quick review which will be coming out soon which is a which is a nice uh, uh, summary of everything that that happened here so for you to take away you can sign up for that on mitblog.com. So thanks very much to all, your, all of our speakers for, for coming out. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And uh, we'll see you next time.